Hello everyone and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. As we go about our lives, we encounter numerous situations that appear to be catastrophic. It might be an earthquake, it might be a war zone, it might be a tornado or a hurricane or a fire or some other destructive force being unleashed. It might be the devastation of a plague. It might even be an entirely human-induced power, such as abject poverty wiping out a city or a country, or drugs simply killing off any semblance of life in an area. These situations always strike us as precisely what they are, catastrophic. We see the destruction and the suffering, the waste and the hopelessness. We see the natural side of things and the human side of things. We respect the natural for what it is, but we simultaneously recognize that this much natural power is something to stay away from if we have the option. When it is something as ubiquitous as an earthquake in an earthquake zone or a tremendous storm in a hurricane-prone region, where the people there have no such options, they simply have to ride it out and hope for the best. The Bible was not a book to avoid the catastrophes. On the contrary, the Bible was filled with these things. In fact, a signature feature of the Bible is its multiple catastrophes. From the great flood to the plagues of the Exodus to famines, droughts, wars, and exiles to say nothing of the ever-looming threat of locusts. Apocalyptic events are expected in the Bible since they tend to be the biblical method of demonstrating God's judgment on the world or something to that effect. If too many chapters go by in the Bible without a catastrophe, one feels that either something is wrong or something is being left out of the story. The fact is that this was always the way things were, not just in biblical settings. Hardly any society in human history was ever all that far away from some potential disaster. It could have been the ancient Egyptians, the Romans at their peak, or anywhere in the Far East or the New World, at almost any time in the long histories of those places. There was always that threat lying over them, and they knew it. No matter how good things seemed to be at the moment, everybody knew that it could all end with the blink of an eye. The overriding hope was that it didn't happen to me or my family, or it skipped a generation. The 20th and 21st centuries are not exceptions to this constant. The natural disasters were always there somewhere. Even in the most prosperous of places, nature could strike or a plague could hit or a war could just ruin everything. Even now, we still have the same number of earthquakes and hurricanes, and if anything, fires and droughts are even worse. Wars and plagues are certainly not things of the past, as recent events have so vividly reminded us. Catastrophe is never far from the horizon, and it would be wise to always remember that fact of life. There is no regular Parsha this week. It happens that Passover this year comes on Shabbat, so the regular reading is preempted for a reading having something to do with Passover. It happens that it it is a fairly short reading that gets right into the nitty-gritty of Pesach, as it is known in Biblical and modern Hebrew. That word does probably mean something on the order of passing over, but it might have more to do with some sort of apparent hesitancy on the part of God to actually do the final plague to its fullest extent. In fact, the actual meaning of, of the word seems to be, mean something like limping, as if God were limping in imposing this plague on certain people and not on others. The reading gets into the actual events of that first Passover, the coming of the plague and the killing of the firstborn and the exodus itself. It has everything expected, the rampant death, the glorious moments of freedom, the taking of the unleavened bread and the journey out of Egypt after 430 years of living in a foreign land. It is told in the future tense, in the present tense, and a bit of the past tense. It even has a classic rehashing of some of the laws at the very end. This reading covers the Exodus and the Passover events in real time. It's all right there if one knows how to see it. From the beginning of the reading in which Moshe instructs the elders to take for their families the Passover lamb and slaughter it, complete with the obligatory dipping of the hyssop in its blood and sprinkling it on the doorpost of the houses, it follows the the storyline exactly as expected. Nobody is to leave their homes the entire night while God passes over the land to unleash the plague. God will see the blood on the doorposts and know to skip that house. 
Immediately following this dramatic introduction, there is a brief reference to some future commemoration of this first Passover when the Israelites have finally made it into the Holy Land. This includes the hint that the children, descendants of those original people who actually experienced the Exodus and the first Passover, will wonder what all this is about. They will ask what purpose all this preparation and ceremony has for them if it is just something out of the past. The answer given is that it that this is the commemoration of that moment when God actually took things into hand and directly intervened in the course of history, unleashing destruction but sparing the Israelites. In the middle of all this is a curious phrase that is easy to miss. It is actually a repeat of a phrase earlier in the Torah when Moshe was first told by God about the coming preparations for the coming Passover and Exodus. This curious phrase in our reading goes like this. And Quote, and God will pass over the doorway and not allow the destructive force to come into the house to plague. When looked at exactly like that, it is easy to miss something strange in the phrase. It sounds exactly like we would expect. The plague is coming, but God will not let the destructive force enter the Israelite houses that had the blood on the door. In Hebrew, however, the nuance becomes more evident. The key word is the Hebrew description of that, quote, destructive force. That Hebrew word is mashchit, which can be translated as destructive force. However, it has a more definitive meaning in Hebrew. It means more accurately, quote, the destroyer. This opens up an entire realm of possibilities, some of which are discussed in early rabbinic writings. They talked about this destroyer, making it out to be some sort of angel of destruction. It was a definite figure or being who was ready to do this destroying, which was apparently its task. The question on this is, of course, what was this thing and why was it necessary? Wasn't God supposed to handle the destruction and perhaps mitigate it in certain places? Is there some other power other than God to which these unsavory tasks are delegated? And if so, what was God's role in the destructive plague. The classic answer to all this is exactly like those early rabbinic commentaries with all those questions needing to be answered. There may be answers to those questions that satisfied everybody who was curious or gutsy enough to ask them, but the answers likely just begged the questions once again. Why couldn't God handle all this alone? Why did God need this other power? What was this other power to begin with? On top of all that, if the doorposts weren't sprinkled with blood, would this angel of destruction simply wreak havoc among the Israelites, even though God really wanted to spare them? Doesn't that go against some notion of God's omnipotence, even over angelic or other forces? To avoid getting into this sticky mess, which would take us into areas of forces of evil and the limits of God's power, we're going to su suggest something else. What if that force of destruction, that destroyer, was simply nothing more and nothing less than nature unleashed? There is nothing angelic about this, at least not in the classic biblical sense of angelic. It is simply a natural plague striking due to the active role of divine power. But to any obje objective observer, it would have been seen as a really strange plague that hits only certain people. Perhaps it wouldn't have appeared all that different from a plague in more recent times that seems to strike some and miss others entirely, even though they appear to be right in its path. This was nature in its naked state. It was a hurricane hitting the coast and just destroying everything in its past, but somehow skipping, for no apparent reason, certain houses or areas. This was an earthquake jolting the region, knocking entire buildings to the ground like tinker toys, but again, somehow missing a few here and there for no apparent reason. Or it was a war or a plague or a fire that destroys with no mercy, but somehow certain people emerge alive and seemingly uninjured and unscathed. What accounts for this, these bizarre happenings? Was it luck? Was it the grace of God? Was it that they were somehow smarter than everybody else? Perhaps... It was this force of nature, which in this case was unleashed by no less than God, but there is a method to the madness. The rules of the game were set so that the natural force of the destructive plague would not be unleashed on those houses that had the blood of the Passover lamb on them. This much seems obvious when looking back with 2020 hindsight, but why is it called 
the destroyer, and not simply a destructive force? The answer to that, not surprisingly, is perhaps this was how these things were viewed in the Bible. What is the natural destructive force if not a manifestation of, quote, the destroyer? It was a, a real thing in biblical eyes, but it might seem a bit more pedestrian in our modern eyes. It is nature in the raw, unleashed and untethered. One final question, of course, remains to be answered. Why did the blood on the doorpost stop this force of nature? This brings us into the realm of the supernatural, which is really an extension of the natural, as the word indicates. Human beings have a power over nature, as demonstrated with atomic bombs and the use of electricity. Those Israelite houses seemed to get lucky during the night of plague. They were spared, passed over. But the reason for this lay within the power God gives us over nature if we play by the right rules. We can be the lucky ones whom the hurricane misses or get spared by the earthquake if we know certain rules of the game. Unfortunately, they are usually not as clear as they were that night in Egypt 3,000 odd years ago. But that destructive power of nature is still the same. It gets unleashed and we have to hope for the best. Maybe we will somehow find ourselves playing by the right rules and experience our own version of Passover. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.